Bill, retiring from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay campus uh, after 46 years of service. And he's the leading scholar on North Dakota's Southern Studies. He came with a Southern war. He said to be the largest group of farmers and growers in the state in America. And we're talking about many years ago, and many of these hardworking people spoke that English. This is a complete dialect. The students of the Southern celebrate his contributions to the university and the state. No one has done more to call attention to our values and settlement than Bill Rock. He has spoken widely about how, Bel how Belgian immigrants helped to shape the door County program, and he continues to lecture and write about the landscape of Southern Door County and how the children and grandchildren of Belgian immigrants continue celebrate their heritage. Bill lives in Sturgeon Bay, a dividing line actually between the land of the Belgians to the south and the land of the Germans and Scandinavians to the north. We are pleased to have him with us this week this evening. Bill? Well, Paul, thank you very much. That was very nice, and I hope I live up to it. Um, oh, yeah, no, no, I like those. Um, I'm here under duress. I had surgery last week, a week ago today, so I'm not real nimble. And uh, secondly, you may be aware that a number of us bought the Our Lady of the Snows Church in Namur. Uh, Bill Choudoir, our uh, county economic development director, uh, a name that's familiar to you, will also be, um, I can't remember his name, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, chair of the uh, Door County Historical Society. Yeah, George Evenson. And uh, the chairman of the Belgian American Society Ray Alexander. So the four of us got together and uh, bought the church. The intent being that it was the key to that settlement area. It was uh, a place that was loved by the locals and it was an important part of their, uh, of their culture and we didn't want to see it die. Um, so I've been doing programs there and uh, at the conclusion of one program, I went to pick up my slides, and they were gone. I don't get it. Who would want those slides is beyond me. But uh, maybe some of the good ladies of the, who cleaned the church put them away, and I just can't find them. But I hope they're safe. So anyway, what I've cobbled together are just a series of slides. They aren't the best, but... Um, I probably shouldn't have told you because you don't know that. <laughs> um, <I'll laughs> All right. No, no. Does that do anything? Let me show you. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah, so I don't know what's going to happen here. But uh, given that uh, bombastic introduction, we'll have to, have to see. I uh, had a uh, committee when I completed my degree, which 
over a half century ago now. Uh, and I, I was doing work in the high latitudes. And I really enjoyed it, and I still do. Uh, and it was Bill Wonders and Kirk Stone and Ken Hare were on my, uh, on my committee. Both, all three of them were top-notch people. And they it, knew I was going to Green Bay. Uh, I had been on the faculty at Edmonton for three years, and uh, they were concerned, or they were aware that I would probably go back home. We had the only grandchild in the family. They lived here in Wisconsin, and we were 2,000 miles away. And uh, now that I'm a grandparent, I think we did the right thing by going back to, uh, back to Wisconsin. And they told me at the time, if you ever go back, make sure you do a local research project because you aren't going to be able to toddle off to the Arctic like I could from Edmonton, which had frequent train service to uh, down the Mackenzie River. Um, so, so I came here and I worked several more years in the north and uh, we were coming here to Door County frequently and lo and behold I became interested in the fact that the landscape in uh, southern Door County, uh, northwestern Brown County and northeastern Pewanee County was clearly different, vastly different. Uh, with a variety of landscape elements. And so that's, that got me going. And with the uh, graciousness of the Belgian community, it uh, continued. So I gave a talk here about my initial research. Was anyone here? No. Were you? I you remember it? Not at all. Neither do I. <laughs> Yeah, I don't remember it either, uh, <laughs> but uh, I do remember being here. And uh, I went through in very close, very fine detail about the construction of the built environment, the houses, the chapels, and the uh, outdoor ovens. I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm going to show them and skim over them and, uh, and then get to some more interesting things. The older I get, the more I'm enjoying ambiguity. And uh, uh, to measure buildings and add them up and divide by whatever is no more, is not fun anymore. So that's what I plan to do. How much time do I have, Paul? Was it two and a half hours? <laughs> At least. But you take your time. No, no, no. Well, I, I'll watch. I'll watch these people when they start glazing over. I'll bow out. Well, the uh, Belgian, you know, is a, uh, a made up country. Uh, it's not very old by uh, European standards. Uh, 1830, it was put together. Um, the, uh, the uh, uh, Germans didn't want the French to have it. And the French didn't want the Germans to have it, but they realized that they needed essentially a buffer state between those two warring factions. And so they created the country of Belgium. You got a guy by the name of Leopold to be the king, and they're off and running. It's never been a state. It's always been two nationalities. And we have to the south the uh, Walloons, speaking a French patois, it speaks French today. The Walloon speakers have diminished, uh, or the language has diminished. And the Flemish to the north was a, 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 a patois of uh, Dutch, and they now speak Dutch or German. So the language, but, but this line is uh, re-identified every uh, uh, 10 years, and they redraw it, it makes no sense, but that's, that's, that's Belgium. Uh, it's about the size of Wisconsin, about a quarter of the size of Wisconsin, 
part of the size, and this stretch here on the North Sea is 40 miles. So that gives you a sense. It's a, uh, a, a pocket-sized uh, country with two distinct cultures, the, Wall the Flemish in the north and the Walloon in the, uh, in the south. Um, amongst the maps that are missing are uh, a, a topographic map of the area. Um, and let me just briefly show you, and, and this you know from history, that this arch through here is part of the Northern European Plains, uh, and immediately to the south you have a, a plateau structure. Here in the uh, Walloon area, it's primarily the Ardennes, those low mountains, high hills that uh, we certainly remember from World War II. Um, it's, uh, and, and then this area in through here is part of the Paris Basin. The, uh, the, 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 our, the climate of, of uh, the, the country is mild. It's uh, cool summers, warm winters by our standards getting a little bit of snow, particularly in the Ardennes, but it usually disappears within a couple of days. So it's a, a very benign sort of climate. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and very comfortable. Uh, now, what the hell did I do with that button? Oh, sorry. Uh, the population map here is uh, here here's Belgium, and in this area, right in through here, the population drops off spectacularly. Uh, Belgium is 98% urban, but that's primarily in the northern area, Antwerp and, and uh, uh, Brussels. Uh, that central area. The rest, the Walloon area, is relatively thinly populated. And here's, here's an example. Here's a village in the Walloon area. Um, it's, it's a lovely, lovely little village. Its uh, buildings are made out of masonry with slate roofs, and it's, a, and it's an agglomerated, it's a, a clustered farmstead with all of the uh, farm buildings in a linear fashion here, uh, with the house right in the midst of it. And um, that's not where I was going with that. Um, the, the uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the, where the farms are clustered like this, the field pattern is fragmented. So the farmers will have some pasture, they'll have some hay land, they'll have some cropland, and they'll have to go out to those fields uh, on, 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 as the season dictates. So here's, here's a fellow with about six cows and he's letting them out in the pasture. Uh, agriculture is subsidized in Belgium and uh, they want to retain that rural uh, appearance of the, uh, of the area. The forests to the higher elevations, this is in the Ardennes, are uh, federal or crown land. And there's very little suburban sprawl. The land use controls are very strict. This, in fact, is a small village. And it's, uh, the villages in the Ardennes, in the Walloon area, are so small that they really don't have much in the line of facilities. So the periodic market is a characteristic of the area. And the vendors come to towns on, in this case it was on Tuesday, uh, and spread out their products.
including very fresh chicken. <laughs> and pork products. And I wasn't sure about this. There's a disco bus. You can imagine people in there disco dancing, but you never know. Uh, no, it's a bookmobile. Now, now, where do we have the bookmobile out of Green Bay? Where does it go? It goes to small villages, doesn't it? Well, same thing here. Here's a farmstead. You saw them in, in, uh, clustered there, pretty much the same. Here's the house, it's absolutely immaculate. And the other farm buildings, this, this aspect of connecting architecture. And here's another one. Here's the main house. Here's the stable. And uh, the, uh, again, connecting architecture. And here's the uh, adjacent farm. So they're all very close to one another. Community is a great element here then. Well, let's see what we have here. Uh, 18, 1850. This dates from 1851. Handbook to the Guide of Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin became a state in 48, sure. We, the state was desperate for people. And so recruiters were sent all over Europe. In the case of Belgium, they were sent there. They spoke Walloon, they spoke Flemish, and to encourage people to come to uh, the states and to Wisconsin. Uh, and, and transportation was arranged for them, and uh, they made it uh, very attractive. Mm -hmm. Climate. Oh, I guess I'll talk about climate in here. The climate was called invigorating. <laughs> <laughs> now, now it, the, the stressful part of the climate for the Walloons um, was both the severity of the winter they didn't have that. And, and the heat of the summer. And Walloon friends of mine that come here in July for Belgian days, for example, coming in their wool suits, you know, they, they suffer, they suffer. Um, so uh, Tommy Thompson would have been great at this, of recruiting these folks to come <coughs> to uh, come to the States. Well, most of them came. Uh, through the Erie Canal, through uh, the, the lake, uh, across Michigan, and ended up either in Milwaukee or here in Sheboygan. What languages predominated? Milwaukee, yeah, oh, they were very German, uh, Sheboygan and Milwaukee in those days. And these folks spoke that patois of French Walloon. So they weren't terribly comfortable for not only the language element, but the whole aspect of culture uh, in, in the Milwaukee and Sheboygan areas. Um, and in a happenstance meeting with a Walloon-speaking priest, he encouraged them to come to Northeast Wisconsin. Um, and, 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 and they did. But the point being, they came here not because of the quality of soils or the quality of the environment, but the, the cultural element of being comfortable in language and being comfortable in religion and all of those things that go with trying to dissect a, a, a culture. And so they came into the southern portion of the Dor Peninsula and uh, this particular map, which I think I did in 70 something, uh, 78, I uh, mapped every Belgian surname on, that were on farms in the area. And those that I had questions about, like a Palahak, a, 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 a Czech name, I would go out and visit. To see, are they really Czech or are they are they Belgian? And uh, and, and then and then filled it in. 
this stippled line then and the, and the shore, and the shore didn't count. I just looked at agricultural land. 80% um, of Belgium. That is remarkable. A remarkable density of one ethnic group in the area. Now, Wisconsin had other ethnic groups that achieved that. Um, the Polish over in Portage County, uh, the Norwegian in some of the counties in the western part of the state, but uh, the point being that this one has survived. This ethnic island, it's not the same as it was, it's not 80%, but it is very persistent, and that's a theme that we'll pick up later. The, the first place that they, uh, uh, they stopped was Champion, there was some discuss, it was initially known as Au, Au Premier Belgique, the place of the first Belgian. What postmaster has been to put up with that? A person that is, first is the champion. So, I don't know about that. I don't know about that story. So I'll give you a disclaimer right off the bat. Um, they, they, this is just five letters, how? <laughs> um, the rural areas retained their ethnicity, the people in the rural areas retained their ethnicity much more so than the uh, folks in the cities. The cities were places of acculturation, of casting off your European characteristics and adopting the American way. Um, and so we had Belgians, particularly the Flemish, who went to Milwaukee, Chicago, uh, uh, some of the other states in uh, Illinois, cities in Illinois. Um, but the rural areas retained that degree of, uh, of ethnicity. And here's the, here's the uh, monument to uh, the first place People come here to see how rose modeling was, was done in the 1850s and 1860s. So, uh, Namur is formerly Gelwick after the Canon Canning Bill, um, then changed to Caroline. as a national historic site. Then in a hierarchy above that, a national landmark. And the Moore area has achieved national landmark status. That's like Gettysburg and uh, 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 area war battlefields and so on. A, a large area. It's 
consists while the total area of that mass that I showed you was 150 square miles, um, the, the area around the war consists of six square miles of the very best of the built environment of the, uh, of, of the Belgian area. Now, unfortunately, I am insisting that the mass drive on the interstate, on the highway, go back and go through, through, the, through Brussels and the war and, and take a look. That's what I implore my students to do. Stop looking at the landscape, and like you, I want you to see it, to look critically at the landscape, and you'll just be, I think, pleasantly surprised at what you see. So, war is a special place. Um, here's, here's, here's a characteristic house, um, and it's not a very good spot, <laughs> but it, this is brand new, everything's up to date in the war, um, is the uh, uh, solar powered unit. Um, it's a gable, front gable house um, with mean windows on the side with a, a very small upstairs, uh, a pent roof porch, and, and doors in the center bracketed by, uh, by windows. But very small size. Um, our son David went to school with a fellow that lived in this house and said, Dad, you realize they have 10 people living in that house? So, yeah, I said, yeah, I understand. What do you think? He didn't think that was very, very nice. Um, uh, so, so this, it's a, it's a small house. What a, now, this is typical, this is typical. You see this house all through the Belgian area. What accounts for the uniformity? Well, the area burned in 1871. When a forest, when a wildfire goes through, it certainly burns the foliage, uh, it chars the bark, but then in the winters of 1871-72, um, up until about the 80s, the Belgians were working in the woods, salvaging wood, cleaning it up so that the insects wouldn't destroy it, and stockpiling it for the building boom that was to follow, uh, and that happened throughout the 80s then. Modest-sized trees, modest-sized house. Big trees, you got the ponderosa, right? Here, you had these relatively modest homes. Now, here's one that doesn't quite fit the stereotype, though it is out of uh, log horizontally laid, uh, and the fit slide is from, uh, the picture is from 1806, and this is the, the Massert house. The Massert's were, were uh, wealthy. You can tell because they not only used the local red brick that uh, fired up red, but they imported Cream City brick, and they were pretty ostentatious in their use of it. Um, folks those masters. Uh, 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 and, and, and typically the garden is in the front of the house. And I asked Charlie Massert when he was alive, I said, are, Charlie, are you in this picture? Oh, yeah. I'm one of them little shits. So <laughs> <laughs> Here's the house from the back. Now, now uh, they said, oh, we got to see this. This uh, got a log in here that's all charred. It survived the fire. No, the log survived the fire. The house wasn't wasn't built yet. And a typical sort of floor plan: uh, first floor, a uh, front door, seldom used, led to a parlor, seldom used two back bedrooms for the uh, old 
older folks in the family and usually uh, the young lady that was pregnant, and there's always be one, uh, a, a kitchen dining area that was constantly in use with a pantry and then moving up the steps here. Uh, the, for the first few years, the uh, upstairs was undivided and was used for grain storage. And then as the farm matured uh, and the family did too, they carved it off into uh, 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 bedrooms. And here you have the log and the brick veneer surrounding it. Uh, why the brick? Well, we saw those houses in Belgium. What were they made of? Masonry, weren't they? Well, that's kind of an aspect of cultural rebound, where people will adopt those ideas of how a house should look like based on, on their experience. And their experience was it should be masonry. And bricks were, were easily come by here. Uh, if you recall where the Boss Tavern was on the old road, uh, there was a huge brickyard there. I think Fabre Creek is the creek just to the north of it. Um, and, and, and so that accounted for it. It provided an additional airspace between the log and the brick so that it was a, a little more comfortable in the inside in the winter. And thirdly, it was fire preventative. Uh, it was resistant to the, uh, to the fire. So that continued. I had a, uh, uh, one of our custodians at the university bricked over his house as recently as 1949. And so there's still this, this idea that you want to keep up with the laments or the you know, Deweys, uh, that uh, you want to maintain that, uh, that aspect. Um, here's the house, all naked, and uh, it was later, it then moved to Heritage Hill, where it was restored, and I was chair of the Heritage Hill operation at that time, and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Laments came, and he walked through the house, and he cried. Oh, I about lost it. Um, it was such a good representation of what he remembered as a, as a kid. It, 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 it's a great house. Well, now, here's one that has some changes. This is a perfect example of the, uh, uh, of, of the, of the house. Um, and it has a very large addition being put on it, which is completed. Up here you have the typical and again, I apologize for the slides, but do we have up there in the window. Is it for example, Susan is talking about a brick carpenter? Oh, very good. You're very nice. <laughs> uh, there's a, a round window or <laughs> half circle up there that is the, 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 the signature of the mason who did the work. On the other hand, uh, it's also been said that that small window provided the light for the Belgian daughters, Belgian virgin daughters, who were kept in the attic. <laughs> now, now, they didn't need much light because there weren't many of them. <laughs> now, this, this house, and it's, ooh, it's one of the... Um, uh, landmark houses. It's between Brussels and uh, uh, Namur. So take that road. Um, and it's on the north side of the road and it's owned by uh, a, a couple that have lived there for some time. They're about the fourth generation to live there. Uh, and they, uh, Mike and Connie Bodwin. And they Here's the highway right here. And they were ready to sell and move out because the traffic on old 57, now DK, uh, was 
more than they wanted to deal with, particularly when they had, they had small children. So, uh, uh, so they were getting ready to move, and then, lo and behold, uh, the highway was relocated. You can sleep on DK, and, and there's very, very little traffic. And so they decided to stay here in the family homestead, and uh, they put on an addition. It looks awful with that Tyvek or whatever it is. Um, but look at it when you go past. They were very careful. They used the same colored brick. They framed their windows the same way. Um, it's, it, they, they're as sympathetic to the traditional architecture as they possibly could be, uh, though it, the, the addition um, uh, is way out of scale for the rest of the house. This is the most famous house in the county. This is just down the hill. Um, the moors to my back, and the village of Brussels is that direction. And here is the uh, another Baldwin house. And it's the only slide I have left of it. So I gotta get out and take some more pictures. But what do you see? No windows. And, and I could just turn the slide around and you'd see the other side of the house. Um, you'd see that there are no windows on that side either. No windows. Well, what they were anticipating, the house dates from 1854 and was one of the earliest houses built in the area, built as a local Dolomite. What were they gonna do? They were going to put barns on the ends. But then, then the recognition that uh, we build with frame here, we build with logs, and if you have a fire in that situation and you have connecting architecture, you're in big trouble. And, uh, and, and so they didn't. They did use the top floor for, again, storing grain, and then they divided it up into, uh, into rooms eventually. Um, the floor plan, it's about one of our most European houses around, has a central corridor. To the right is the uh, dining living area in the front. To the left is the parlor. And then you go back to the back of the house and it's a kitchen on the right and a bedroom on the, uh, on the left. So it's, 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 it's very traditional in that regard. Then the other thing that we have to look for are the roadside chapels. Um, framed, an altar, a kneeler, not much else in there, a uh, cross on the top to give it some identity, and this map uh, will show you where they are there are 26 of them in the area. If you haven't seen one, start looking. And stop in. They're open. You, please, please go in there and take, take a look. They're just large enough to change your mind. Um, and, and here it is, and here it's in a predictable location. Here's the farm, here, here are the outbuildings, and you notice that the chapel is not right against the driveway. It's removed from the farmstead, so it's clearly separate, but part of it. Um, and it's close to the highway. To accommodate the priests, when there were enough priests to do processions, and they would come by and bless it. Um, or to those who wanted to worship at the chapel and want to park along the highway. So it's accessible, they won't disrupt the farm, the farm family. And uh, uh, it, uh, so, so that's, that's the characteristic of where you will find them on the, uh, on the farmstead. Uh, this one is the, uh, this one's been moved. Uh, uh, the family that took over the farm had no interest in it. And so the um, some good folks in the area moved it. Uh, it is uh, St. Jess Lane. St. Jess Lane has kind of fallen out of favor. You heard of her? No. 
and it has, a, it has, has the words Bay Forno above the, uh, 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 above the door. It was, uh, the fellow that owned it was so proud. Jewel van der Tye. Jewel was about this tall, uh, strong as an ox. And I was talking to him about his chapel and he put his arm around me and he shook me like a rag doll. And he said, dear, in my chapel, I got art worth thousands. <laughs> well, here's a, here's, that's kind of interesting. It's got arts and thousands. Plural for Walloon is a real problem. THs for a Walloon, just like they are in French, is a problem. So arts worth thousands came out. And then not worth thousands. Not worth hundreds. Priceless in the eyes of, of Jewel van der Tye. Symmetry is a great Belgian characteristic. Look at this. This is the this is the same chapel, but this is in in, in Belgium. Notice that they're stone. They're, uh, 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 in this case, built into a church wall. They have a, a, a Gothic arch. They're open to the elements because, again, the weather is benign, not, a, not an issue. And they're even out in, in, in the beech forest. You find these, uh, these chapels. The other architectural element is the outdoor oven. Now, the oven in this group is distinctive uh, because virtually all of them have the oven appended to the back of a summer kitchen. In summer kitchens, there's nothing unusual about the summer kitchen, but to have the oven attached, appended to the rear is unusual, and very often that oven is, uh, is incorporated into the interior of the kitchen. Uh, the access is through the wall, and this hole is to uh, facilitate re-cementing uh, uh, the, uh, the oven. Ovens are uniform. They're six feet deep, four feet wide, and two feet high. They bake by uh, a reflected heat heat that has been retained by the uh, interior, uh, by, the, by the bricks, and then re-radiated to what's ever in the, uh, uh, in, in the oven. Obviously, the f things that require the highest temperature and longest bake time are put in first, and then it, uh, and the pies last. Uh, there are about 25 of these. Now, if you know where the Belgian are, Belgians are, you have to know where they aren't. And I have a suspicion that one of the people in this picture <laughs> is not of a local ethnic group. <laughs> well, this is just south of the, of the uh, Belgian area, and this is in the Bohemian Czech area, which also has a rich, uh, 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 material culture as well as, as non-material culture and is something that I'm looking into right now. But I couldn't resist her. This guy better have his heart checked. <laughs> now, now, diet is certainly a distinctive element. Oh, you must go to Belgian days. It's this weekend, isn't it? Was it? Where was I? I missed it. Darn. Well, I know where it was. I was being flat on my back. Anyway, um, uh, Belgian pies, homemade trip. Uh, 
food service, uh, DG's, Palm Garden, uh, and a, a Kermis. A Kermis is a Thanksgiving celebration and family reunion. There are nine of them held through, uh, it means church mass. Nine of them held throughout the area on a, uh, on a, on a regular basis. And each, each village has its own little Kermis. Now predominated by the local bar. And uh, very little is done in terms of religion or, or but the, uh, the food is there. Booyah, shrimp, free pie. That's interesting. Go back to the slide of Marchand's store. Marchand's meat case has a disproportionate amount of pork compared to a typical meat case that we would find here at, at, at Pick and Save or, or Econo or any of those places um, where, where beef way outranks uh, pork. But the, the, an affinity for, for pork products followed by uh, fowl. So uh, let's take a look at that. Years ago, um, certainly after we moved here and maybe into the 90s, um, Walloon would be spoken at Marchand's. But boy, I haven't heard any there for years. And Coach Kensinger dishing out the, uh, the booyah. No, not a Belgian, a uh, Hispanic. One of the reasons that I incorporate this, I incorporated this into my classroom, my cultural geography class, is that it's the story of, of my kids. Uh, it's your story. It's, it, you know, it, it is the coming to the new world, going through the aspect of acculturation, making your mark, and and moving on. And boy, the Belgians had a tough go of it. And this young Hispanic girl who's, who's working in a, a, a Mexican drive-in um, you know, has a tough road to hoe. Our vast majority of our students need to be reminded of what, what this takes. Oh, 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 oh. And even with our uh, Hmong population. The same thing is true here that uh, I, I want to make a, uh, a point of, uh, of that. The big day for the Belgian community is August 15th. What is it? Assumption. Assumption Day. Assumption Day, sure. Uh, the date that recognizes that uh, Mary went to heaven. And uh, they gather there. There's, here's, the, uh, here's our, lady, here's our uh, lady of Good Help Church. The priest is up here. Here was the uh, school that Sister Adele constructed, had constructed. And um, this, this was a big event. This is bigger than it was in it's August 15th of uh, 2011. Maybe a few hundred. August 15th of 2012, the place was jammed. <laughs> the, the altar boys were, were back of the altar, breaking the hosts into halves, then into quarters, to, just to, to uh, make sure that everyone could participate in the uh, communion. So that, that's, and if there's one structure that is tied closely to the Belgian community, it is, uh, it, it is Our Lady of Good Help. Now, since it's been 
identified as an apparition site. And, and those slides are also, I don't have them. Um, it is just flooded with people. The parking, the, this area where I'm standing, you think of the picture, that's all parking lot now. Uh, initially, a couple of days after the, uh, uh, it, the announcement was made, uh, I was there in, in, and uh, Karen, the docent there, had a couple of porta potties out there. And I said, oh, Karen, this is not going to do. You're going to have to get better, better facilities here because there was only one indoor toilet and that was in the narthex of the church. Oh, she said, um, Sister Adele was a, a, a very humble person and she wouldn't want anything that was ostentatious. And I said, well, if you want humility, go and use that porta potty in January with a 20 mile an hour wind. <laughs> uh, well, since subsequently now they have built a pr proper, uh, proper facility there. But that's enough. And it's the day that the bishop will be there and parades around the uh, back 40 of the, uh, of the church. And, and that's the path that Sister Adele took, praying the rosary as she led a procession around that area. The fire of 1871 approached from the northwest. It came up to the boundary of the property and bifurcated, went right around. One stroke, another stroke for Sister Adele. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, and that was a real honor. You didn't take that as so at the time. All right, here's another interesting feature. This was at the Brussels. Belgian Day Parade a few years ago. Do they do this anymore? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think so. If you were tall enough to reach the, the float, you were tall enough to get a beer. Not, not a good idea. But there again, man, Southern Door has problems with excessive drinking. There's no question about it. S David went there. We were concerned about him. Uh, said it's, it's tolerated. It's tolerated. Now, now, when you're dealing with a group like this, think, on the one hand, think of the elements of a folk culture. And on the other hand, think of what we are, the secular society that we have administrators, we have rules of law and enforcement of law, we have all sorts of social <laughs> service agencies, and the, the folk society does things within the family or the, or the band. David was brought home a couple of times by the local deputy. Bill was sorry I brought him home. Uh, You'll take care of this, won't you? That's how it was left. And uh, so, so there were no, for example, there were no nursing homes up until about 10 or 15 years ago in the area. The elderly were taken care of at home within the family structure. So uh, the society is still has some elements of the folk culture there. It thrives in part because of the uh, reinforcement from the old country. Every other year, a group from here goes to Belgium. The opposing year, a group from Belgium comes here. And so there's that constant kind of reinforcement. Now, 
And here's our church of Our Lady of the Snows. This is Father Vernon's just about ready to stop. Um, it persists. It is still the largest Belgian ethnic island in the United States. It exists because when the youngsters had to leave the family farm because there was no work to occupy them, they went to Green Bay, Sturgeon Bay, Algoma, and to a lesser extent, Kiwani. So that they were within a few miles of the home farm and they could continue to participate in the activities with the guys that's playing ball and shooting deer. Um, for, the, for the women, it's doing their parties, their showers, their, all of that sort of stuff. That continues, and it continues today. We laugh when we go past a uh, urban Belgian family in Green Bay, and they're all sitting in the garage on a Sunday afternoon. <laughs> well, that's just the whole aspect of, of getting together. And the garages are spotless. There's nothing wrong with that. So um, this is our church. Um, we, uh, we're, we're, and uh, the, the uh, Lady of the Snow Cemetery, and we're uh, programming there. We do uh, four meals a year. Uh, we'll be doing a kermis in another two weeks, uh, a variety of fundraising events. The Belgians are just classic. Now, Gary, I hope you're all right with this. <laughs> but you'll, you'll appreciate it because you see it too. If we have an event from 10 until 3, the vast majority come promptly at 10, they stake out their place, and they talk incessantly until 3, and they get up and leave. I mean, they just thrive on that. And you know, what, what are we going to do when we, the old people start coming there? So we're trying to cultivate the younger generations to, uh, to enjoy that. But anyway, uh, it's been a great experience. Um, oh, and, and this, you'll see these signs this time of year. And they acknowledge the contribution of that well-known suffragette Lucy Gravel. <laughs> On that note, I'll get the heck out of here. But before I go, Paul, you see that everyone gets one of these, please. And then I'll follow along with a brochure, which I, which I don't have any slides of anymore, of uh, the, uh, the, the apparition site and the uh, uh, description of Sister Adele. Now, if there are questions, Yes. Yeah, yeah. The conventional wisdom tells us that um, the priest just was unhappy and he wanted to expand the parking lot at the expense of the um, at the expense of the uh, cemetery. No, um, I remember in the 50s and 60s that the cemetery was, what was it? Yeah, it was a mess. And, uh, 
Yeah, it was a hazard. And the, the priest recognized it as such and, and cleaned it up. They could not place headstones with the appropriate grave site. And so he clustered them in, a, in one spot. So, No, no, not the new highway. Though, um, the parking lot impinges on maybe six feet of the old cemetery. So, anyway, the, the yes. The question was, what about Belgium, Wisconsin? Well, there is a, 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 a province in Luxembourg that is called Belgium. And those Luxembourgers live in Luxembourg and, and, and in, in that area, and so that's why the name is there. The same is true with Luxembourg, Wisconsin. Those are Belgian, but there's a, there's a, yeah, but, but there's a province in Belgium called Lux. Yes. Well, first of all, why, are there other why, why do people persist here? They like it. Or why don't people, other people move in there? Oh, well, that's happening. So the percentage of Belgians in the area is diminishing. And you can only, only have to travel around and see that homes built by seasonal or, or, or retirees are coming. That's the farmer's social security. I mean, he's selling off his property in five acre segments um, so that he has, has, has some retirement income. Is there a, 